We're going to take a closer look at pine wilt now. Damon, this is a huge problem in Oklahoma and surrounding areas. Could you tell us first a little bit about the disease complex? Sure. Uh, the the uh, disease complex is my, mainly caused by a, a nematode that infects the tree. Um, the nematode actually gets in, feeds on the resin uh, um, elements in the tree, mm -hmm. and also goes through a fast replication cycle. So not only is the feeding a problem, but the clogging of the xylem conducting elements, which are the water conducting elements of the tree, uh, that's also a problem. So, you know, the symptoms we primarily see are what you kind of see here with the wilting mm -hmm. uh, conditions, sort of indicative of drought stress. Uh, but what's a little different with this uh, particular disease is you have the needles that actually remain attached to the tree and they'll, they'll sort of have a wilty, droopy looking uh, um, uh, symptom. And so, you know, we'll see, we can see it sort of progress slowly through a tree mm -hmm. or it can go rather quickly and it's sort of dependent on temperature and how fast the nematode can actually go through its life cycle. Um, at, uh, you know, lower temperatures the nematode will actually go through a life cycle much slower than at, mm -hmm. uh, at higher temperatures, so typically we see a lot of the damage um, at, at warmer temperatures when that life cycle is very quick, very fast. Now another interesting aspect of the, the life cycle and the disease cycle is that the nematode has to arrive at the tree through a vector. That's correct. So to complicate the system a bit, the nematode is actually introduced into the tree uh, through, uh, by a cerambicid beetle. Uh, the nematode actually has a very intimate relationship with the beetle and can survive within that, that beetle. The beetles are drawn to uh, uh, typically stressed trees, um, and so in Oklahoma, a lot of our exotic pines are, are more stressed than a lot of our native pines, so we typically see uh, greater problems in those exotics. Um, so uh, the, the beetles are drawn to that tree, um, the beetle feeds on the tree, and in that process introduces the nematode to the, the tree, and then that whole process uh, uh, takes place with the nem nematode and the, the cycle, the life cycle and the feeding and all that. Mm -hmm. um, also, what the, with the beetle has brought a blue stain fungus, so typically, you know, if you cut into a tree, you see uh, what's called blue stain, which we'll show you in a, in a little bit. Um, that's indicative typically of an, of an infection and that blue stain is also carried with the beetles as well. Okay, now I'm sure you get this question all the time, what can I do to avoid this or prevent this in my tree? Sure. Uh, typically most of the, uh, uh, what we're after is stress prevention. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're targeting the uh, beetle in this case, the beetles are drawn to stress trees. Okay. So if we can uh, keep the trees from being drought stressed primarily, um, uh, then we'll help reduce the likelihood of the beetle being brought to the tree or being drawn to the tree. Okay, so uh, in a landscape environment we typically recommend to homeowners to keep uh, keep the trees watered adequately, not too much, mm -hmm. just adequately. Uh, try not to let them get drought stressed, especially you know in Oklahoma in, in July and August typically. And uh, you know a little bit of fertilizer, although most of the time in landscape environments there's plenty of nitrogen around so we usually don't have to worry about that, uh, primarily water. Uh, from the nematode perspective, there are some injections that could be applied to the tree. There's been some research in Nebraska as well as Kansas. Mm -hmm. A couple injection products, uh, one's Greyhound and the other's Pine Tech. Um, and they have been shown to reduce the damage, uh, but they're primarily preventatives. They're only going to be applied prior to the introduction of that nematode. So it'd have to be a high value tree, a tree in a landscape that somebody really wants to, to protect and those injections would then be applied in that case uh, to prevent the nematode from being introduced to that particular tree. The one drawback is they're, they're pretty expensive and, and mm -hmm. they need to be reapplied periodically. Okay, well let's take a closer look at some of the symptoms that we see with pine wilt. Sure. <clears throat> Primarily early on uh, you'll notice uh, that the, the, as I mentioned, the uh, needles will droop uh, but they'll be retained onto the, on the branch, mm -hmm. uh, turn brown. We can, like I said, uh, it could be a slow progression, sort of in this case where we just have a few of the needles here that are, are beginning to move on, or it could be rather quick, rather dramatic, where we mm -hmm. notice whole branches going uh, rather quickly. And we would notice those really quick symptoms, or those quick symptom development, um, uh, you know, sort of 
during, when it's hot, when we have drought stress and those sorts of conditions. Do we typically see symptoms develop on the top or bottom? Is there any pattern that way? Uh, you know, there's no real distinct pattern. Okay. You can see just regular branches. Um, you know, this you can see is kind of in the inward, progressing outward. You know, you may see a symptom typical of that in most cases. Uh, the other thing that happens is resin production will uh, be greatly diminished uh, because uh, the nematode feeding on the, on the resin ducts and also the, the fast replication of the nematode clogs up those, those resin ducts and so we have a, a large uh, reduction in resin production. Joining us now is Jen Olson, plant disease diagnostician with OSU's Plant Disease and Insect Diagnostic Lab, or PDIDL. Well, Jen, thanks for joining us today. Certainly. Now, if we have a tree in the landscape that we suspect has pine wilt, what do we need to do? Well, the first thing you want to do is take a proper sample. Very often we get something small, something like this, that mm -hmm. is really just too small um, for us to be able to do anything with. So when you sample your tree, you want to collect something that has at least about an inch, inch and a half in diameter as opposed to something pencil size. Uh, so um, we're going to show you how to take a sample okay. off a tree that this mm -hmm. tree clearly has uh, symptoms of pine wilt. We can see the wilted needles mm -hmm. died rapidly. And when we're sampling it, it's best to try to cut as close to the trunk as you can. Um, the nematodes are going to tend to die more quickly. We want them alive. We need them to be alive for how we do our test in the lab. So if we can get it, we're gonna take this big branch. Mm -hmm. yeah, must be. Let's see. Okay. So what we could do now is cut this into a couple smaller pieces, mm -hmm. and this would be something that we could mail in or take to your county extension office and have them send in to us for testing. Um, one of the characteristics of pine wilt is that it, it causes um, the tree to be very dry. Okay. So we can see that this, you know, has really, aside from having the needles phase, it has the dryness as well. And in bigger portions of the tree, mm -hmm. we have part of section here, you can see there's what we call this blue stain mm -hmm. fungi. Um, once the tree is dead, the nematodes are actually feeding on this fungus as it invades the tree. Uh, so it'll keep them alive longer until they can be carried to a new host by the beetles. So if you are having a tree removed, um, another good thing is to just to, uh, take a section of this and mail it in to us. Okay. Now what do we do with the tree um, that is clearly dead and we know has pine wilt? How do we dispose of it properly? Once we have it in the lab um, and we diagnose it with pine wilt, we will send back a report mm -hmm. that gives recommendations on what to do. And the recommendation is going to be to remove the tree. Okay. And we actually recommend, uh, usually we start to see the trees die sometime between August and December. Um, and we would recommend having it removed by about May the following year. Because this tree is going to be a source of the nematodes to infect nearby healthy pine trees mm -hmm. or pine trees that are under stress. So you would want to have it removed, and we actually recommend that the wood be burned, not used for firewood, because mm -hmm. again, it could be a reservoir. And you would want to take the stump all the way to the ground, um, grinding it, chipping it out, uh, to eliminate that. And I think it's important you mentioned not to cut it up and use it as firewood, because then we have the potential to move that beetle sure. around in the nematode. If you do want to use it for firewood, then it would want to be your first source of firewood where it would be burned up by May. Okay. <laughs> that you wouldn't hold it over for years, but a lot of times it can't be cured in that amount of time. So mm -hmm. um, usually it's best just to completely get rid of it if you have a lot of susceptible pines in the area. Okay. Well, thank you very much. No problem.